Hello. Well, we call the islets endocrine cells because they secrete hormones into the bloodstream. And if you do not have diabetes, your islets, and especially the insulin producing cells in the islets, are checking the blood glucose levels in your body every minute of the day and night. And they're secreting the precise amount of insulin needed to compensate for that. But if you're like these two cuties up here, you have to check your blood glucose all through the day and sometimes through the night as well. And you have to administer insulin. And so by the time Calvin was six, he had already had 16,000 finger pricks to test his blood sugar and 10,000 insulin shots. So we would really like to give Calvin and Marin and all the people with type 1 diabetes back the cells to make this process invisible so that their life doesn't revolve around their blood sugar. We all know there are bad statistics about problems with diabetes, but today's a day of hope, and we're going to talk about what's coming and how these problems are going to be solved. So you've heard a little about progress in the field of islet transplantation, and actually beautiful things are being done, and you've heard a number of talks. Well, it might surprise you to know that we haven't transplanted children, and the reason is because the drugs that we need to give in order to um, keep the body of the patient from rejecting the islets also keep the body from fighting off infections. And so chronic immunosuppression versus type 1 diabetes, that's not a great trade-off. But there are a couple of features about islets which make them very exciting so that we can envision some other possibilities. And two of those features, excuse me, trying to get the, uh, to move the slide forward. Excuse me, yeah. And one more. Two of these amazing features about islets are one, they don't have to be in the pancreas to function. And two, out of your entire pancreas, the islets make up only a couple percent of the material. So we're talking about needing to replace much less than an ounce of material. And that gives us the idea, what if we could just hide them from the immune system and leave the patient's immune system intact? And so what would a technology have to provide so that we could do this? Well, we need a port so we can load cells into the device. And you see that at the top. And then we need a material that will keep the islet cells in and keep the immune cells out. But we need to have pores that allow nutrients in and allow sugar to be sensed from the bloodstream and insulin to be released. And we need the pores to be large enough, and this is important, so that that process happens quickly, that as soon as the blood sugar is sensed, the insulin is released. And today, I'm going to tell you about um, a device that is um, made out of a rain jacket-like material. So we started experiments to find out if this device was truly immunoprotective. Are we going to be able to transplant people and not do anything to their immune systems so that they can fight infections as they need to for the rest of their lives. Now, probably all of you know that if cells from me were transplanted into you and you have a healthy immune system, those cells would quickly be rejected. And that's what happens here in control experiments. When we put cells inside an animal with a healthy immune system, the cells are very quickly destroyed. And to do these studies, we've used a little bit of molecular wizardry because scientists have isolated the protein that allows fireflies to light up a summer night sky. 
So we can actually watch the cells simply by taking pictures. And now, if we say, what happens if we encapsulate those cells and then transplant them, what you can see is that they last basically indefinitely. And further, we kept some animals to 140 days, and we could have gone even longer. So it does look as if this device protects against what we call allograft rejection, which would be from one person to another. Now, of course, in type 1 diabetes, we have, a second kind, we have a second issue. There is an autoimmune problem in which other cells from the immune system target the insulin-producing cells specifically. So we need to be able to protect not just from allograft rejection, but from autoimmune disease. And we wanted to make sure that the device could do both things. So we put islets inside, and at a time in a diabetic animal, when you can find no red cells in that picture, where blue shows you all the cells, but none of them are making insulin, if we remove the device that had the transplanted islets in it, and we look at a cross section through it to see if the cells inside are healthy, we find beautiful, healthy islets inside, cells that make insulin, and cells that make glucagon. Now, this was actually even better than we expected, because our worry was that those T cells that attack the insulin-producing cells in a type 1 diabetic person's body would have sensed that the islets were there. And even if they couldn't get into the device, they would be surrounding the device. And those cells can make some toxic substances we call cytokines. And if they surrounded the cells for long enough, we were very concerned the cells might ultimately die because of these cytokines. We can't make the pores small enough to keep those things out because we need other proteins to be going in and out. So it was excellent news that the uh, cells did so well for so long in a model of type 1 diabetes. And to make sure that we can move this along to, uh, for clinical use, we also ran a preclinical trial, which was a similar type of study to make sure that as we move toward uh, primates, we're going to have success with this device. But now we had a big problem. Adult human islets are very fragile cells. We lose many of them when we isolate them from a pancreas. We lose many more when we transplant them. And we lose more still when we put them in a device. So that sounded a little bit like a dead end. But we knew from years of studying pancreatic development that there's a point in development where pancreatic cells have formed, and they're actually progenitors to become the endocrine cells that make hormones. But they haven't started making hormones yet, and they're hardy. They don't die so easily. So we did an experiment with human cells where we put the endocrine progenitors in the device. And we asked whether those cells, because we thought they'd survive very well, could they mature inside the device and maybe even alleviate diabetes in an animal. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And so you'll see in a moment why that was quite important. Well, about this time, scientists in the area have been working very heavily, and you've heard some of the talks on stem cells. And that's because we need a virtually unlimited source of cells eventually. And there is a company in town, Viacite, and they were potentially the world leaders in moving stem cells into pancreatic cells. And they had, in fact, gotten all the way to the point of those pancreatic endocrine progenitor cells. But they could not seem to make pure, mature insulin-producing cells in the dish. And they tried so many different treatments, but instead of endocrine, they got schmendocrine. <laughs> the cells went haywire. They made multiple hormones. They didn't make just insulin as they should. Well, our results 
were kind of promising in this regard because maybe instead of spending a few more years trying to get these cells to fully mature in the dish so we could transplant them, we should transplant the progenitors they'd already made. In fact, our, our data would argue that if we waited till the cells were fully mature, they were probably going to be fragile when we tried to transplant them. So the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine funded my laboratory and uh, Viasite to work together and ask whether we could marry this virtually unlimited source of cells with a device which would allow us to transplant patients without any immunosuppression at all. And what we did first is put that beautiful firefly protein into the cells so that we would know that the signal we got in our images matched the cell number that we had transplanted. And as you can see, when we put these in animals, we get a beautiful signal and we can follow how well the cells are doing. And we waited because these endocrine progenitors don't make insulin to begin with. We had to wait for them to mature inside the device. And we waited. And then we started to see human insulin produced. And in fact, what we can tell from this graph, and I think you could read these data now, is glucose responsive insulin secretion is moving up and up and up around day 100. But what you can see from the red bar is that the amount of firefly light signal is staying the same. That means we didn't just get the cells multiplying and get more insulin that way. We had cells the same cell number, but they matured inside the device. And in fact, these alleviated diabetes in animals. Now when we take those cells out of the device, we have what we've really wanted, perfect endocrine cells. They either make insulin or they make another hormone, maybe glucagon, but they don't make all the hormones at once. And that's very exciting to us. Now, ultimately, it's very important that you never get insulin unless you need it. Insulin should only be released in response to glucose. And we call this a stimulation index. How much insulin is released when the blood sugar is high versus at a basal level? And in fact, we looked at a number of these animals and found that their stimulation index was very good and that these stem cell derived cells could control diabetes in animals. And so at this point, what are the things we could be doing? Well, we have shown not only that the cells function well in the device, they also don't escape from the device. They can be removed at any time. And all of these studies were done by placing cells under the skin. But imagine, what if we can figure out a way to freeze cells in the device and ship preloaded devices to doctor's offices? Because we're thinking it's going to be a relatively little incision to transplant these cells. And what if we had auditoriums like this devoted to 3D construction of new device designs so that a scientist in islet biology and a bioengineer and a mathematician can stand together designing in 3D devices of different sizes, shapes, and materials to make sure that the blood flow works correctly with each design. These things are all possible. They're no longer the stuff of fantasy. Now they're the stuff of funding. And we hope to keep this moving as quickly as possible. In fact, we even have robots that it, in this day and age can test 100,000 chemicals a day to try and find a cheap chemical alternative to some of the expensive factors we use in the dish to turn a stem cell into pancreas tissue. So if you have type 1 diabetes, you are probably frustrated and tired of trying to control your blood sugar. But it's not going to be this way forever. And medical science is moving so fast that it's likely 
that you're going to have more than one choice. And so the important thing at this point is to take really good care of yourself right now so you're in the best shape possible when a cure comes. Thank you.